Hello, everybody. Welcome to Free Thinkers Hub webinar. Uh, today, our subject is empowerment through language and how to retain your sovereignty. And there's a number of things we're going to cover in that, which is how to better understand language um, in terms of its use and misuse, because clearly language has been and can be used to manipulate. So how we spot the signs of language misuse in politics, business, media, etc., cetera, um, and how to speak from an empowered sense of self. And I have the perfect person to come and talk to um, us about this, and it's Adam Badowski. Um, so Adam is founder of Logos mm -hmm. Education. Adam, interestingly, is um, a Polish guy living in Malta. Um, he works in liberal arts education globally, uh, helping people to understand their use of English more. Um, and uh, he also recently joined a team called the Con Consilience Project, which looks at the existential risk of uh, the breakdown of language and how it can be used in language warfare. So that's all about information, language and communications technology. Um, and amongst other things, uh, Adam has also translated for a number of different sectors, including government and also education sector. So, for example, TED conferences. So without much ado, I'm going to pass you over to Adam um, to start the webinar. Welcome, Adam. Hello, uh, Amina. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited to share some of the learning that I've uh, amassed over the last, especially last two years, I've been really on overdrive to uh, make sense of things. So thank you for having me. Okay, so um, do you want to share your screen? Mm -hmm. Oh no, uh, one sec. Okay. All right. So just whilst you load that up, I know that um, just having look, looked at the slides earlier, um, there's a mm -hmm. lot of very interesting content in there, and I'm really looking forward to you sharing that with our viewers. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. I, I hope uh, I tend to do yeah more, more slides than necessary sometimes. Let's let's see how we go. We have uh, 42 minutes, I believe, right? Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. So this is the title: Empowering Through Language: How to Better Retain Sovereignty in the Age of Information Warfare. And uh, three simple objectives is to simply become more aware of uh, maybe things that we don't have time to look into um, on a daily basis and to discover some of the techniques and strategies uh, that could be employed to mislead or distract or manipulate otherwise uh, through language and uh, communication. And finally, um, I will offer some kinds of uh, recommendations, some things that I have been applying in my own uh, practice uh, to, yeah, to, to, Im to improve my sense making and improve my, um, uh, you know, to retain some agency in, the, in this havoc, informational havoc that we're living through right now. So the first idea is this uh, quite a new, um, in, in cognitive psychology that's been, uh, last couple of years have been very productive uh, last maybe, I don't know, three or four years. Um, and thinking about language as psychotechnology, we know other technologies such as maybe meditation or um, uh, exercise, or there, there's different technologies that we can think about, we can do with our own body, so uh, which change our consciousness. And the language is considered uh, by some um, cognitive scientists as, as one of these. So we'll look specifically, I will start with. Um, linking language to cognition and and then uh, we move on to communication uh, and we look into how powerful words can really be because the language seems to be that something that we just use and we've always had it so we um, on a day-to-day -day basis we rarely get the chance to really focus on the true value of, of uh, being able being articulate as we are why am I one second um, so, I will start with a few kind of core religious accounts of how the world is spoken, like cosmological perspective, if you, if you like, how the world is spoken into existence, to just really zero in on this idea that word and thought 
are almost synonymous for the ancient societies and in these foundational texts um, upon which the whole civilizations were built, uh, you know, language is really something that this creative force, this God or the divine agency uh, brings the world to existence. And then we move on to, um, you know, more day-to-day -day examples of that in cognition as well as uh, communication. So this is our roadmap. We'll look into, uh, later we look into uh, the protocol of mind control and how language is, uh, or, uh, and communications are being um, manipulated within that protocol. And uh, the case study by Hannah Arendt um, into the language of Adolf Eichmann, who uh, was the, basically managing the, um, sending people to death camps in Nazi Germany and across the Nazi, across the Third Reich. And how uh, she she got into a lot of controversy. I look at uh, I talk about it later. But the point is that basically her point is uh, she was so brainwashed by the propaganda that it's kind of difficult to say when he was being tried in Israel. She almost couldn't find him uh, genuinely feeling guilty because he was so brainwashed to the point of of through language and uh, you know the the complete deception around the whole um, ideology that you're submerged in. And then finally, we will we'll, uh, wrap up with uh, recommendations of what we, what we can do to help ourselves in, um, in the kind of uh, warfare that we're, we're stuck in right now. So to start with, the idea of logos, um, as we see, logos is a, is a great Greek word, um, most commonly known by um, uh, fr from from the work of uh, pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus, um, but it keeps re uh, reappearing in different texts and in different languages. And is this idea of the cosmic universal principle of intelligibility uh, that is dispersed throughout the universe, basically? So so things have structure because there's some rational. Um, there's a rational kind of uh, uh, DNA or, or, or a nucleus within things that are in order. So they are created things. It's not just chaos. Logos is order. And um, so we have this, you know, it could be computation, could be reason, could be also discourse. So this is where the mind and word converge in this idea of logos. I find it really fascinating. I think Jordan Peterson um, has done a lot of work. There's, there's many talks about him. Um, uh, where, where, where he really explores this, this idea. So the first text, uh, one of the uh, oldest um, texts that we know, um, is the Babylonian myth, myth of creation, Enuma Elish. And uh, at the very beginning, it says, when the skies above were not yet named, not earth below pronounced by name, when yet no gods were manifest, no names pronounced. So you see, like before anything was named, it was just chaos, just formless mass of, of matter and time, kind of chaotic. And then uh, gods were born within them, Lamu and Lahamu, otherwise known as Sumerian Enki. Uh, their names pronounced, they emerged. So the god, the divinity emerged together with, with speech, which is uh, pretty amazing. Then we see... Uh, more in our tradition and in, in the, the, the root of the Christian uh, tradition and, and Judeo-Christian, uh, you know, roots of Western civilization. Obviously, we have John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and um, and other examples. So this language being like like in, inextricably inextricably uh, linked to creation in in religious uh, narratives and uh, in a uh, Gnostic tradition here we have um, the Nag Hammadi library which is the, the gospels that were kind of cut out of the official scripture and then found in uh, Egypt in 1944. So now we have all these kinds of different alternative uh, Gnostic scriptures and we see the same trend. Uh, um, since then the faculty of speech has come to expression and the faculty of speech pertains to the gods, angels and people. So again we have this this link between the humanity, uh, some celestial realm, and uh, and speech. Um, now let's move on. So this was kind of just to give a little bit of a bit of background. Uh, how how speech, as I would argue, my thesis would be that our language and our speech is something that we should really treat as sacred and as 
intrinsically valuable, not only a tool for communication or tool for getting what we want from life, but actually it, it helps us think. And we will see it how um, further, how our development of language actually got us to where we are now. Because um, this is from a series of lectures by uh, John Varvecki from U University of Toronto. Very fascinating. There's like 50 hours of this um, awakening from the meaning crisis, um, a course. And, and uh, from one episode, I use this bit where he kind of goes through history of um, our human uh, evolution of language and how the evolution of language contributed to evolution of societies. So especially two major revolutions like the Pale Paleolithic uh, revolution, which was uh, between somewhere between 2,000 and 30,000 years ago. Before that time, human sapiens, sapiens, we weren't really, I mean, we weren't, I suppose, truly sapient there. We were, we were just, we looked biologically, we were the same. The hardware, our cognitive hardware was the same but uh, our language was basic so we couldn't really challenge other species around us until at this time we have developed we've developed abstract language so which allowed us then to uh, create art so this is a time where the cave paintings in france and and similar uh, sites where actually human beings become creative and we develop as a, 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 a ritual so there's some worship and there's some totemic kind of religion emerging and that contributed to social bonding as well because we then have once we have abstract language we have the sense of we can have ideas of trust loyalty and uh, maybe you know anger stuff like that that these are abstract concepts which otherwise we cannot really uh, conceive of and this has given us advantage over other hominids and, and other species. And we have basically effectively after that uh, conquered the rest of nature. And uh, signif another significant development, uh, interestingly, uh, again, nothing biologically, we, were, we remained pretty much um, as we had been until that time. But what happened in the, uh, during the Asian Revolution after the collapse of bronze uh, empires like Mesopotamia, Egypt, and, and all those uh, massive empires, there was a big crisis, but what, and, and it created great uh, pressure on human cognition to, to evolve very quickly without actually changing biologically. We had to evolve the software of language to become, uh, to, to survive simply. So we, so this alphabetic literacy and numeracy has contributed to this kind of, you know, um, the idea that once you write the language down, you can reflect on what you've written. So if you look back to your, to your writing, you've written, let's say, uh, it is day now, and I return to that piece of paper and it's, um, um, you know, 12 hours later and it's night and I realize that I'm wrong, right? Like it's night now, it's not day. So. So it allows us, you know, uh, especially alphabetic literacy, which is much more learnable than previous codes, like uh, previous uh, scripts like cuneiform and, and others. Um, but we can actually reflect on being incorrect. So it allows us to self-correct and uh, numeracy as well, which was developed around the same time, helps us to uh, reason logically much more rigorously. And that is argued by John Varvecki um, contributed to our higher sense of responsibility, how a higher sense of um, what we consider to be humane um, these days, that we basically, um, we have become, uh, our, our sense of responsibility was, was much greater. So alphabetic literacy contributed to our realization of self-deception, which will be important as we talk about propaganda later on, how, how it's the use of deception is, is the chief tool of it. And uh, obviously, once we realize self-deception, we can learn to self-correct through, through uh, reflecting on what we write. And likewise, um, numeracy, this abstract symbolic thought of, for example, using money and counting, um, and gave us a, a, a more sharper kind of focus on numbers and being able to uh, calculate stuff and not only in, in numbers but calculate uh, just rigor, rigor, being rigorously uh, logical. So the final statement uh, he makes in this lecture is that people start at this stage understanding the double-edged sword of their own cognition. Undisciplined 
It leads to violence through self-deception and illusion, but discipline through self-transcendence and self-correction leads to wisdom and the ability to reduce the violence and suffering. And this is, you see, I think this is very key. And it really hit me when I was watching the, the lecture thinking, it's amazing how how language itself can can be a, an instrument of peace or an instrument of war if misused. Uh, very profound. And likewise, we can have either effective communication, which which kind of is aimed at synthesizing information and trying to reconcile the contradictions and, and try to you know s go towards agreement, or otherwise we can. Um, we can also invert communication, which is then doesn't really serve the purpose of communication. It, 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 the, the purpose is reversed. So we create conflict, but maybe then we can kind of to, to self, for self-serving agendas, if we're not really concerned about the, uh, the whole system of information as much as we care about what we can get from information. So is this what uh, 500 years ago people would say would be the black magician would be the person who only care about themselves and they will manipulate reality to their own advantage whereas the wizard or the white magician would would try to uh, work wonders to the benefit of all and it's very simple protocol obviously there's a thought we have a thought emerging in our mind we conceptualize it uh, as as word in, in language and then we can enact it in reality so this protocol can be used for both of these, um, you know, both of these algorithms uh, of effective and, uh, well, inverted communication just as well. So effective is simply, just to give you an example, back to the caveman reality. Um, you know, I'm hungry. I want to know where the food is. I ask my compatriot Oak, where, where's the fish? He shows me the... Um, he gives me the word about where the, where the lake is. I go and hunt my fish and I'm fed and I'm happy and the, and the purpose of communication is complete. It has served, uh, it has um, accounted for reality truthfully, right? And the reality has been represented through language and communication accordingly. Whereas the invited communication is like the locus of what we will look into uh, when we are not interested in, in genuine sense making and representing reality, but misrepresenting reality so we can get what we want for ourselves or maybe our tribe or our nation or our people or whatever. So it is to manipulate the perception of reality or in others, in those who we try to deceive, to induce desired behavior in them. So instead of representing reality, we first think we inverse the process. So we think, what kind of behavior do I want now, first? Second, how do I adapt the words and how do I adapt the narrative um, to, to fulfill that agenda uh, through controlling of the perception in the, so controlling the, the, the consciousness of those subjects who I want to influence through language and communication. And as the, if, I'm, if I am successful in doing that, then that individual, it could be on microcosmic level between you know, two individuals, or it could be on macrocosmic level, like between a state and maybe and their people. I can, I can uh, manipulate the perception uh, of the target population. So they, those individuals there, these collectives of individuals, then take collective action, which actually change reality. So we see how the creative force of language how when when we have especially when when it's amplified through technological means as we have them now you know hitler said he has conquered germany only thanks to radio he only had radio hitler and press right whereas uh, the technologies we have these days uh pose completely different dimension of risks uh, to the same protocol so as the real actions um caused by manipulated consciousness and, and controlled perception change reality, we are in the realm of uh, mind control, um, as um, has been practiced and researched. So just to kind of inverted communication, as we see, is the third bullet point and how it fits in the wider protocol. I will not focus on the rest of it because we're talking about language today, but uh, just to see the, um, the context. It's first, we obviously, we want to isolate the target or population and control the perception. And uh, we do it very successfully by altering the emotional state 
And that will be very relevant to when we talk about algorithmic manipulation in, in, in social media platforms, maybe fear mongering in the media and basically keeping keeping the population on, on their toes all the time. So so we are more likely to react from this primal frame of mind. So we, we don't really um, our frontal lobe is kind of bypassed and, and we react from the, the we're limbically hijacked, as it were. We are we react from the state of emotion rather than from the state of critical reasoning. And uh, this is critical for, um, for, for achieving perception control. And obviously once, once the subject population is in, in that uh, heightened emotional state, it's very easy to manipulate uh, perception and feed them any um, narratives and uh, versions of events or interpretations of facts they could be same facts but the interpretation of facts could be misleading and uh, so few examples of manipulative language just the three kind of the of the top of my head uh double speak we know we know it from from our world but um it's simply it's simply deliberately euphemistic uh, or ambiguous or obscure language so it could be as it's usually it works on the basis of associating um, associating a, 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 a thing or a, a fact either positively or negatively depending on our agenda so for example if we care about framing um, framing and having no symptoms as a problem of illness then we would be more likely to say asymptomatic but if we, were, if we want to focus on health, we would rather say someone's simply healthy, like, yeah, they may have some viruses, but they're not really sick, are they? So um, they are healthy. Likewise, you know, there was this, uh, this controversy with uh, Joe Rogan and because he took ivermectin and there was a big, big uh, uproar about that. And CNN called him and, and other media outlets kind of focused on it is true that ivermectin can be used for as a horse dewormer, but it is also a human medication, you see. So now we are in the area where the truth, it's not simply tr saying the truth or lying, but focusing on the aspect of something that is perhaps um, amplifying the, the fact that it's a horse dewormer to characterize um, Joe Rogan in this case, uh, as someone as dehumanizing kind of almost Joe Rogan and and, tr and and framing him as 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 a as as someone completely um, a bonkers right Where, whereas he was prescribed this ivermectin drug by his own doctor. Uh, so double speak basically uh, deliberately misuses or focuses amplifies a, a certain aspect of meaning of some um, um, certain aspect of meaning of of of, of word or concept while ignoring others um, to fit the agenda. Likewise, whoever, you know, characterization is a very important tool uh, of, as we know, in our cancer culture, which is, which is um, pretty, uh, it's widespread these days. So whoever dares to, to contradict the, the dominant narrative, um, well, it's, it's, it's being punished by, by being characterized like, um, being an anti-vaxxer or being conspiracy theorist or being but even also on the other side you know people who um, who find themselves in this camp of, of, of the you know heterodox position uh, calling calling the, the conformist, conformist uh, a crowd sheep that's again that's already falling even um, we need to remember what, what Hitler did you know and what all totalitarian regimes do they dehumanize through language by uh, calling the, the opponent of whoever the opponent is um, in non-human terms. So even calling someone sheep as uh, someone who clearly acts uh, in a sheepish way, but, but just labeling them, we're still being part of the mind game by calling people names, um, whatever the name is. So um, we're being part of the protocol. We're not really escaping it. So it's, that's how clear it is. Uh, another one is gaslighting, which is um, basically denying the evidence of, of the senses, so which creates cognitive dissonance. So there's two 
um, injunctions, both which are contradictory, which, which are mutually contradictory, and they are supposed to be equally true. For example, in in day to day life, we know like someone cheated on someone, and they say, "Oh no, no, it, it doesn't. She doesn't matter. You know, like it doesn't matter anything. It's nothing. It's like." The reality is something else than, than the reality being sold by the person. And likewise, it could be by the media, by the, uh, by and marketing is very popular, obviously. So there's plenty of examples all around. And uh, one of the examples um, we learned from Lara Borodisky, uh, uh, who, who researches this kind of um, problems at the University of San Diego, uh, California, San Diego. Um, there was a there was a study uh, when they presented a, a, a two uh, parts of population with uh, with exactly the same content um, about there being crime. Like there was the fictional fictional uh, town, and uh, there's a problem with crime. That there were statistics, there were numbers, and and the only difference between these two reports uh, was that in one. Crime was framed as a beast, and in, in the other, the crime was um, kind of in language, cu cush like cushioned in language of a virus. Like the, this crime is a virus, and this kind of so there's two two kinds of frames for the same set of facts. And what uh, turns out to be the case is that the people um, with the information. Uh, with crime referred to as beast would be more like about then the people asked about um, the researchers asked about their opinions and the opinions were like oh so we need more prisons we need more police control we need more there was more like towards the penal and kind of punishment uh, aspect of how to solve the problem and when the people uh, presented with uh, people who were presented with crime as virus narrative uh, when they were asked about what to do how to help the community so they were more towards like more reformist uh, stands like uh, maybe we should we should create a community uh, maybe uh, people should be you know diagnosed everyone should be healthy and well and uh, maybe you should have yeah like community uh, meetings and so so the community feels good and um, so yeah as more towards reforming oriented whereas the the, the other would be a lot more like towards the, uh, incriminating uh, the the uh, um, uh, whoever is the perpetuator of that crime so this kind of shows us that um, also very importantly when when those uh, participants of the experiment on each side when they were asked what influenced your opinion what influenced your judgment about this uh, they said oh look these statistics you gave me these statistics this is what i think this is why i think there should be more police or this is what i think it should be more I don't know, uh, healthcare should be better in that area or whatever. Uh, obviously, so it's completely passed them by. And likewise, uh, there's another experiment, Ashes a conformity experiment shows there's another insight and result of that one as well. We don't like to believe that we are being manipulated. It's obviously very uncomfortable for us to believe that our opinions are not our own. And this is precisely the cognitive bias that is being exploited by um, the manipulative protocols in language and otherwise so even a simple you know single metaphor can be this kind of trojan horse that um reconstitutes the entire understanding of the topic at hand and the problem another example just very basic people who um, um well we speakers of english we know that the uh, active voice is uh, we, we use for certain for when we promote ourselves we use active voice when we write our cvs or, or when we do our marketing, we do, uh, I do something, whereas passive voice is more formal. So we use uh, for maybe something is being done and the politicians like this language and uh, obviously in positions when, when, you, when you don't want, when you want to obscure the doer of the action, then you use the passive voice. And obviously we see in this example as well, how a, 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 a same fact can be framed in both ways. An officer shot a person, that's one thing which leaves no ambiguity about who did the action uh, but when we want to remove the responsibility of, or maybe make it impossible to discover who did the action we can say officer involved shooting we see this language a lot um, in reporting because it's 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 taught in uh, in uh, 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 teaching english as, as as a language as a foreign language it's, it's taught as a formal 
a um, way of using language um, very commonly. So, yeah, we need to see how this is the probably most one of the most innocent and benevolent examples of this, but also we have, um, we will see how this can be weaponized to, to much more nefarious um, purposes. So finally, uh, to finish this kind of uh, the invisible influence of language part, um, this is Tristan Harris, he used to work for Google and uh, as a, he was an ethicist at Google and now he, he as a director of the Center of Humane Technology and he said he spreads awareness of how the social media and, 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 and digital technologies are being misused and, and uh, hacking our brains, in fact. So it's, um, I find his work very useful as well. And he said, we live in a colonization where uh, of these psychotechnologies, which are an arms race for taking control of our perception of reality. And this is not even about some, some bad actors. People don't. I believe that most, in most of cases, people don't realize it, uh, that they, that's what they do. But these protocols and these algorithms are running, uh, running, you know, platforms and uh, affecting our behavior and our perception of reality, they have to compete for our attention. There, there's an arms race, and because clicking is worth more than making sense of the world. Um, we we are in this very difficult situation now, where we have exponential. Um, exponential uh, advancement of information technologies while our cognition remains, our, our small frontal lobe remains what it is. And uh, oh, yes, yeah, so we, we're in a very, very sticky situation now where we can just talk to each other about these things in webinars, but um, it hasn't been really looked into, hasn't been acknowledged really as such a crisis. Um, now, we're going to transition to political part, um, and I would like to open with Dostoevsky's quote from Brothers Karamaza, which I find one of the most amazing quotes, um, because we're going to move towards, uh, you know, deception and self-deception, how it is crucial and central to, to the propaganda and uh, brainwashing and stuff like that. So Dostoevsky says, a man who lies to himself and believes his own lies becomes unable to recognize truth either in himself or in anyone else, and he ends up losing respect for himself and for others. When he has no respect for anyone, he can no longer love, and in him he yields to his impulses, indulges in the lowest forms of pleasure, and behaves in the end like an animal. And it all comes from lying to others and to yourself. There's so much in this quote, it's so dense, it made me think so much and linked and, and connected so many dots that I hope, uh, I'm happy to share this presentation if you, if you, you can look into different sources and, um, and explore for yourself. We only have um, some, some 10 or 15 minutes left, so I will just move on. But it's good to remember how, how lying and cognition, how lying undermines the very, or at least the, the premise of this thesis, that the lying undermines our very capacity to think because we lose the idea of what truth actually is at the end of it. And um, and now off to the Hannah Arendt's analysis of Nazi propaganda. And um, there's an idea of the banality of evil. Uh, she coined and she got into a lot of trouble for, she was really mis uh, she was misunderstood uh, what, we, what she meant by that. She meant, um, she meant by this, this frame that the results of terrible crimes can be created by, by, by millions of ordinary citizens who never meant anything bad. They basically, they continued doing what they were supposed to do. They continued doing their jobs and they continued to obey uh, and, and uh, refuse themselves, uh, 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 you know, the courage to speak the truth in uh, reality that is completely uh, isolated from <laughs> well, reality, a simulation of reality that's isolated from the actual reality of, of, of human condition. So what she said is Eichmann possessed no hatred, no malice, because she was, the context of this is basically Eichmann, um, yes, he was uh, responsible for killing millions of uh, not only Jews, but whoever died in the, in the camps. Um, and uh, he uh, she was uh, hired by the New Yorker to, re to report on this trial of Eichmann because she's Jewish herself. So they kind of put her in this position of, uh, of, of um, um, a political philosopher who, who reports on this, on this event. 
and uh, her report was upsetting because she focused more on language and more on brainwashing than on blaming Eichmann. Although she never said he was he was um, he was innocent, but she said the she was stag the, 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 he was just like an accountant to her. Uh, like it was difficult to. He was so passionate about the moral certainty of the Nazi Party, and there was no satanic logic. She says there's no. Uh, all all he was was this, this startling willingness to conform, the desire to obey, and inability to think. So his agency was kind of extracted from him. From from him, according to Arendt, he was completely uh, hypnotized by the whole by the whole um, reality he was submerged in, according to her. So, and then she says in, in another, uh, her earlier work, because she's committed, basically, her, she committed her, her, most of her work on uh, studying totalitarianism. Uh, she says, totalitarianism in its as, uh, at its essence is an attempt at transforming reality into fiction. It is the attempt to corrupt and uh, uh, attempt of corrupt and patho pathological state actors to impose a fictional account of the world onto the entire population. Spontaneity with its incalculability is the greatest of all obstacles to total domination over man. It is to follow our conscience and place morality above unjust laws to fearlessly pursue personal con and communal values and to give voice to our thoughts undeterred by the ridic ridicule. Uh, further, she says, Eichmann repeated word for word. So that's her, her witnessing him, him being interrogated at the court in, in Jerusalem. She says, word for word, the same stock phrases and self-invented cliches. The longer one listened to him, the more obvious it became that his inability to speak was closely connected with an inability to think, namely to think from the standpoint of somebody else. No communication was possible with him. Not possible, not because he lied, but because he was surrounded by the most reliable of all safeguards against the words and the presence of others, and hence against reality as such. And the other aspect, she says that the, 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 na the, the atmosphere of self-deception within the party, within the Nazi party, was, was, it was a prerequisite for survival. And, you know, it, it makes me think, obviously, uh, this is like the most extreme example, but I go back to uh, some situ professional situations where, where, where I had to extract myself from during the COVID time because I thought, basically, in order not to cause trouble, I must pretend, I must lie, you know? Uh, and it's this choice we, can, we have to make. Do I continue? People believe they can continue lying just for the sake of peace. But little do we realize that over time, it actually de destroys our capacity to make sense, to, to be able to say the right from wrong and, and, and true from, from false. Obviously, it's not going to be over one week or maybe one year, but over five or ten years, yes, it can, it can completely skew our perception of the world and, and morality. So Eichmann's astounding willingness to admit his crimes was due less to his own criminal capacity, Arendt says, for self-deception than to the aura of systematic mendacity that, has, that had constituted the general and generally accepted atmosphere of the Third Reich. Uh, and this is a, a quote about some of the officers in the, from the, same, from the same, uh, same piece of work. It's, uh, it's this little book by Penguin. So uh, it doesn't take much. There's lots of wisdom in it, though. Um, so uh, reporting um, by other officer, Nazi officers is like they would say something like they would twist again, reframe the problem of them being perpetrators. They're not perpetrators. When they had to commit these crimes and, and murder people, they would say, what horrible things I did to people. The murderers, um, they say, what horrible things, again, not the active voice, what horrible things I did to people, but the passive, what horrible things I had to watch in the pursuance of my duties. So there's this, this idea of duty and the greater good is like, you know, the Nazis must have believed that they are, they are creating a better world, you know, like, and all this suffering and all this genocide was just a necessary evil for a greater good. Obviously, um, it's, 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 uh, critical for any um, ideology like that to be successful. So how heavily the task weighted upon my shoulders. 
And, uh, and the final um, kind of uh, point is how murder was rephrased uh, through Hitler. So none of the various language rules carefully contrived to deceive and to camouflage had a more decisive effect on the mentality of the killers than this first war decree of Hitler in which the word murder was replaced by the phrase to grant a mercy death. So a, a, a classic textbook example of new spe of uh, double speak, right? Instead of murder, you say to grant a mercy death because those people, those different kinds of non-Aryan people, they are, you know, and we want to put them out of the misery of living because they're so inferior to us that, we, you know, we grant them mercy death and these death camps were called charitable foundations for institutional care obviously we see how it works and um, yeah further she says Eichmann assured that he was not lying and that he was not deceiving himself for he and the world he lived in uh, had once been in perfect harmony and the German society of 80 million people had been shielded against reality and factuality by exactly the same means the same self-deception, lies, and stupidity that had now become ingrained in Eichmann's mentality. These lies changed from year to year, and they frequently contradicted each other. Moreover, they were more necessarily the same for the various branches. Uh, they were uh, they were not necessarily the same. So there were there was there were inconsistencies between these narratives, but that was part of the kind of mundacity of it and deception, and people just you know. Um, self-censoring, I suppose. It's, it's something we see now as well about COVID and, and everything, isn't it? Like, it's almost difficult to speak uh, without the threat of, of being uh, challenged, even if we mean well and if we want to be um, and we act in good faith. Why am I... Okay, here we are. So, just to finish off... Um, So this is just like a final final point um, to bring it to, to, to where we are now, because obviously we've seen this extreme example of Hitler's Germany, uh, the, the most extreme we have um, a record of in history. And, um, and except from Adam Curtis's um, documentary, Hypernormalization, and he says something like this, we live in a world where the powerful deceive us, we know they lie, they know we know they lie, they don't care. We say we care, but we do nothing, and nothing ever changes. It's normal. So we are like what what is meant by the post-truth world is like we have we have kind of grown skeptical. As the skepticism is the final tool of propaganda that people don't even expect truthful politicians, right? We take it for granted. That's what the politicians will always do. That's what politicians do. We say like you are being considered a naive or idealistic or just living in a la-la land if you expect the people in position of, of authority to not be liars and deceivers. But clearly, if you want a better world, you have to. You have to. Uh, we can't accept it. You know, I'm, I'm with Curtis and like uh, Russell Brand and others who, who claim that uh, well, we first time in history we are at the point where we can actually and the port, uh, first time in, in the evolution of humanity, we're at the point of the advancement of technology and advancement of, of human knowledge and interconnectivity of, of human beings that uh, to cooperate across the device and across nations and across uh, races and any other, um, you know, obstacles that may, may, may be there between us to actually create a world that is better. And I think language um just to just to back on our end language is 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 a sacred tool to make sure that we if we if we treat language as we treat our bodies and going to the gym and running and, and eating well we should treat language with the same uh due diligence and care and and um you know uh nourishing language and and making sure that we look after it so the final point uh final slide i know we were um we're reaching the end. So a few tips that I have been applying and um, I believe uh, have liberated me at least to some extent um, from from the warfare that we, uh, you know, informational warfare. The first thing is like Jordan Peterson, he, he said that there's one specific instance when he said, speak the truth and let go of the consequence. And it's obviously, 
this is the problem, isn't it? We, we, we want to speak the truth, but we don't want to lose the job, but we don't want to lose a friend. We don't want to cause trouble because it's so much in our evolutionary, uh, you know, uh, survival kind of mechanism that we don't want to stand out. We want to survive with a group. But uh, the point he's making is that, you know, in these, in these scriptures, in these religious texts, whether we're religious or not, it doesn't matter, but there's an idea there that if you speak the truth, the order you produce is good. And it doesn't matter how it appears at the time. Because if you don't speak the truth, you're just, you're just postponing the consequence of, of, of telling lies or endorsing mistruths, let's call it even, you know. Uh, so, so that has been very powerful for me. I've kind of tried to speak the truth while at the same time working on my drive to be provocative, try to really reduce, not doing it out of the need to be provocative, but actually uh, towards uh, only when it's absolutely necessary. And uh, that leads us to, we ha to, to, to the necessity of really looking after our emotional uh, well-being. So because we're being triggered and all these uh, devices and all these uh, AI protocols and algorithms and, and the way the news is being served is really optimized for triggering us, the triggering the fear, triggering anger, triggering, uh, you know, othering other people and, and creating conflict that we have to kind of uh, become immune to that. So we do it through psychotechnology such as the mindfulness and uh, being reflective and being uh, by daily meditation is, is a top, uh, obviously, exercise to reduce stress so we get less triggered and simply try to be curious about information. When someone comes up with an, with, with an opinion or a narrative that we like know is complete rubbish, let's try and see if there's a 1% a, a of, of truth, 1% of valuable information we can learn from. And that's something I've been trying to really work on, um, uh, which, which kind of gives us this, this humility to self-correct. So. Once we are, you know, as long as we are calm and we can, we can uh, gain humility and curiosity and mindfulness about our own uh, use of language and our own uh, understanding or lack of uh, thereof, uh, we are on a good path. And obviously we will fail, but hopefully we'll fail less and less and less as we evolve towards a more enlightened, uh, you know, uh, to be in, 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 in line with the uh, warfare. Uh, or rather, you know, being, being more and more resilient to it. So, from the technical point of view, we can analyze uh, discourse, like if we see information, who has posted it, why, what would be the agenda, what's the funding, we know this stuff, like it's the basic kind of uh, critical thinking uh, protocol. And maybe rather than fact checking, we frame checking. So, so we need to frame check for when someone uh, makes an argument to us, um, and we disagree, we have to kind of break out of, we need to make this framing that they've created or, or the framing that has been sold to them perhaps uh, by a certain outlet, a news outlet or, or another friend or, or, or community or whatnot, um, which information uh, is, is obscured, which information is maybe amplified and duly is this information representative and we need to reframe it and try to seek of why our frame of the issue is incompatible with the other frame. Um, by doing that, we kind of extract this, like I said, about the, you know, there may be even 2% of, of valuable information and 98% and, and of noise, but the, the skill that we need to develop is to, is to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff and actually, um, you know, be able to seek the signal from the noise and uh, throw away what's what's not needed and and salvage what is valuable from the information and finally and probably most importantly uh, since war is aimed at conflict and escalating conflict the point of good communication is to have good faith and to all of the above actually is is uh, uh, um, good faith communication encompasses that we are not it's not to win the war um, it's rather to succeed at not engaging in the war, uh, to have earnest endeavor and always be keen to learn and uh, question ourselves and our opinions and perceptions of reality. 
and um, have good faith in language. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. That um, was a very, very enlightening webinar. Um, we're going to open it up now to anybody who wants to ask any questions uh, at this stage, just to post them in the chat uh, function, if you, if you will. Um, but uh, <coughs> there's certainly um, some uh, a question that's come to my mind um, as you were speaking, and I know that you um, focused a lot on uh, Nazi Germany and the use of, of uh, language to support totalitarianism. Um, but do the same principles apply across all languages, or or are they just specific to some main languages like English, German? etc. I wouldn't be able to say since I don't speak every language and I'm not really I'm not actually trained in uh, language you know in, in, in information warfare I'm a philosopher with with uh, some linguistic background but I would believe that um, that human as far as we're concerned with language as a tool of cognition there would be same drives in regardless of the language, it would probably be applied, I believe, in a different way, uh, according to the grammar of that language and the reality, you know, linguistic reality of each language. But, uh, well, we know that war is universal, so I wouldn't expect uh, information warfare to be otherwise. Thank you. And uh, I know you touched on, on, you know, the algorithmic nature of uh, manipulation of language. Um, is, is there more you can say about that? Is it different from verbal um, organic language in, in that respect? Well, uh, well, from what I know, again, like I know that Facebook has done some uh, tests which keywords get mo mo most reactions and most clicks and I suppose the difference between organic language and mass digitalized kind of carpet messaging such as Facebook or one of these platforms is I suppose is the magnitude isn't it because the language remains the same but uh, we know that words such as uh, hate obliterate you know when we put it as a clickbait when you put like oh Ben Shapiro obliterates a social warrior blah blah, blah or like uh, people react to this kind of language so um, I suppose language is language it's just the technologies which we use to convey uh, to, to use language uh, can have exponential uh, exponentially more detrimental results because then you obviously you 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 spread it to millions of people at one time rather than individual to individual. So yeah, and they in fact these algorithms which are optimized for conflict, like platforms such as Facebook, even though we use it peacefully, hopefully most of the time, but it's still optimized for reaction. So it's I'd say less than a language itself. It's more the algorithms pitching individuals against one another predicting our moods and then exposing information to us that we would be uh, that we are likely to engage with uh, with negative emotion would be that that would be the more i think uh, what i've been thinking about uh, in terms of algorithmic uh, manipulation and that clearly not only addicts us not only people talk about um, dopamine hacking and all of that that that's absolutely true but that's something worse than addiction is uh, conditioning. It conditions our behavior to be more reactive, which is the opposite of what we need, right? Um, so this is how much I can say about the algorithmic um, from my side. That, that's uh, really interesting, Adam. Uh, just one more question here. Um, have human beings become too lazy in our use of language? For example, cliche slogans, etc. Is it possible to to pull this back? And I know um, just prior to us clicking the record on this webinar, we were talking about how the you know the social spectrum, the you know the use of the language connected to emotion is reducing as we've got a rise in autism, and whether we connect that to um, uh, vaccine strategies, etc. So, is it possible to start pulling this back? 
Hmm. That's a big question. I don't think I or anyone could actually answer this at this stage since the issue is not even really acknowledged in the main, mainstream science. I, this is very fresh. We're talking about language. Um, you mean uh, to, 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 to seek to educate people, well, to, 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 to retain our agency as sentient beings. This is your point. Yeah. yeah. To, yeah. I, I think it's, it's absolutely necessary. And I think there's a lot of, in fact, the only thing we cannot afford doing is being apathetic and uh, skeptical about that. Like I have no choice because you see, I'm an educator. I work with people, I teach language and I found myself uh, working for, uh, I will answer. Thank you, uh, Georgia. I saw your, uh, I will answer your question in a minute. Uh, I found myself in, in a situation where I'm supposed to be a language educator, but at the same time, I'm, not, I'm supposed not to use certain kind of language. And I'm thinking, no, surely I have to simply do what I was right to do and see what happens. And I think many, many people have had enough by now and they speak up and they organize and they found um, organizations. Surely it will continue and our numbers will be growing. The, the question is, um, will everyone be saved from it? I, I believe not. I, I believe not the entire humanity can be saved from the, you know, these developments you're talking about where the, the emotion is being extracted and kind of downplayed even uh, in, uh, so, but I'm not, I'm not pessimistic. I think we're in the very early stages of, of uh, becoming a better uh, species as human beings, but we have to go through uh, several, several hours of the darkest of the night before we reach uh, the dawn. Thank you. And uh, as you say, um, George has posted a question to you, and it is, um, do you, Adam, uh, can you be open about your own stance? So I'm assuming uh, you're interpreting that in a particular way. Um, well, how, do you, how do you read uh, George's question? Uh, I believe, George, tell me if I'm right. I mean, the stance, uh, would the stance mean that uh, I believe that our information ecology is uh, broken deliberately by actors who seek to undermine our capacity to think for ourselves and communicate well. Um, if that's the case, then yes, I, I do believe that. And uh, in fact, to speak about the theory, but what are your ways of expressing this world control madness? Yes, exactly. Well, so it was very well, it was kind of difficult bef until I started speaking up. In fact, and my only yeah, I have. The point is, there's always risk of getting cancelled, and I have been cancelled before. I used to because I work in education. I work with young people and well, and adults as well. But at the time, first time I was cancelled um, by being. Pre I'm pretty frank, uh, but on I try to be authentic and honest. But some of this honesty is obviously getting um, under people's skins and people in uh, more power than myself. Um, yeah. It is fine balance, but I think we at this point of not really being able to to maintain balance. We either because we, the, the polarization is so great. Basically, uh, the break the big break was when I decided to leave the company. I had this like big opportunity with this big uh, company not that long ago in 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 um, uh, December, and I and I was ready. The contract was signed, and I was gonna go and travel to that place where the big opportunity was waiting for me. And that was the whole new future for me with that company. And then I had to make a choice like, do I want that or do I want to speak the truth? And I chose to, well, luckily I was almost sold to the idea until I had a, this one morning I had a conversation with one of my best friends and he really kind of reawakened my conscience in me. And I started to speak up since then. And I've, the, I've canceled the contract. I've come, I've kind of almost removed myself complete, completely from, from, I kind of only work a few hours a week with those company now. And I, I set up, I decided to set up my own business. So I think 
economical economic independence is one thing that allowed me the uh, the bravery or, or maybe the bravery of speaking the truth which i do now publicly and i do it and on platforms like linkedin and I, I i openly engage in conversation because i think we have to we cannot we don't have the luxury to hold back at this stage because if we if we allow ourselves to be robbed of open and transparent communication with one another uh, we already gave we gave up so yes uh yeah i'd be i'd be, I'd be um excited to connect um well, we've actually come to the end of this webinar, and I want to say a huge thank you, Adam. It's been really, really enlightening listening to you, um, not least because you trace the history of, of language and, um, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, its very origins. And uh, for me, as a spiritual person, you know, to connect it to the celestial realm and to be fully sentient and to see language as a sacred tool, just to be reminded of that, um, you know, because we live in a, an age that's so devoid, um, you know, of our humanity, um, has been wonderful to, to hear all of that. So just before we do end, um, I just want to say, because I know that the, some participants are, are reaching out to you um, to say thank you and thank you uh, to myself also. So thank you for appreciating what we're doing here today. Um, so, where can people find out more about you? Uh, I guess I guess LinkedIn is where I post whatever um, whatever is going on, and uh, yeah, LinkedIn. And I have a website that's under construction, so I don't really share that yet. But LinkedIn is a good good starting point, and we can talk there. So okay. I'd be excited to. Connect. Okay, so we, we've come to the end of this webinar. Um, I'll, I'll post it in Free Thinkers Hub and uh, for there for the replay for anybody to um, find the, the notes and the references because you've got copious references there. There's some stuff that I'm really going to enjoy looking into. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, for anyone who's not joined us live today, um, you, you can obviously watch it in the replay in the site. So once again, Thank you to everyone for taking the time out. We have run over slightly, but I, I, I hope you agree. It was a really interesting discussion um, uh, that followed on from the webinar. And um, yeah, so thank you for your time. And Adam, absolutely thank you for giving us such a unique um, perspective on um, the use of language. Uh, it certainly opened my eyes up a lot. Thank it's you. a pleasure. It's a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.